Welcome to Table Talk. We have a episode here with a Mahjong centric focus. So hopefully all Mahjong enthusiasts will be joining us tonight. On this episode, we'll be joining me Ahuva Elnor and she, like me, is a Mahjong instructor, group leader, avid player, and collector. I'm not so much a collector. I just have probably two vintage sets, but in comparison, well, there probably isn't one. So without further ado, let me bring on Ahuva. Hello. Welcome to the show, Ahuva. Hi, Michelle. Hi, everybody. So good to see everyone tonight. We have Terry Apple joining us, Venora, Dara. Hi, Larry Dara. Sue. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the show. We have a hi from Wisconsin, Venora. Reva joined us, Judy, Irene, Audrey. Excellent. Tony's here with us. Hi, Tony. Aloha. Oh, it's Tony. <laughs> Tony uh, uh Tony R. hey Tony Tony R we have Peggy Greaves with us Helen Susan lots of visitors thank you so much everyone for coming to see us all right well Ahuva let's let's get started and, and share about Mahjong so let us know how you learned how to play Mahjong. Everyone's got a beginner story. Okay, so I was about 10 years old when I first uh, learned how to play Mahjong, and my family and I would go, and my family, my, my sister and my parents and my little bird, my canary, we would go up to the uh, bungalows, to the Catskills every summer, and um the ladies at the bungalow colony played Mahjong. So my mother naturally played Mahjong and so did all the other, many of the other women there. And I guess as the daughters of these ladies who played Mahjong, we also learned. I actually do not remember who taught me. I'm sure it was not my mother, but uh, we had many friends. We all went to camp. And I believe that maybe one of the gals mother taught her and so in turn, they taught, this girl taught us. Okay. But I'm not clear on it at all. Uh, I think we played with a wooden set. I remember these little tiles. They were very light. I think they're made of balsam, possibly, or some very light wood. And I may be making all this up, but that's what, I, that's what my memory has, that okay. they were little tiles. And I do see them every once in a while for sale. I think they're advertised as children's sets. But I do okay. want to purchase one just to have, because whenever I see the picture, it reminds me of my childhood. So yeah. basically, that's how we began playing. And I only played in the summer in the Catskills. And I did not play again for many, many, many years after that. But I was around 10 years old when I began. Wow. How old were you? I was 12. And I, I learned in when we were stationed in Tacoma, Washington, I learned Wright-Patterson Mahjong, which is Air Force rules. And I probably played on a set from 73, I believe it was new at the time. So just a commercial set, nothing too special. But I think the racks were that, were Bakelite. They were not uh, the current plastic. So it was a set from 73. And I don't know where my mom got it, but I have a lot of special memories playing Mahjong uh, with my mom. Actually, we played the two of us together. She taught me. So we each played two hands at one time, which so is kind of like funny. Siamese. That I the know. originator of Siamese Mahjong. <laughs> we didn't call it Siamese, but we did play two hands at one time. It's kind of funny how life can be uh, kind of cyclical like that because now I do Siamese Mahjong uh, you know, demonstrations and teach people how to play that. And so it's kind of funny how it circles back around. So I see many photos of the balsa wood uh, tiles. And I've seen them, I think, at that traveling Mahjong exhibit at the museum. Oh, okay. I don't remember the name of the exhibit, but I remember seeing that particular set. 
That's interesting. So what actually triggered you to learn it again or pick it back up as an adult? So what happened was my mother owned a set. She had only one set and it's a white. Actually, I have a tile here. So it happens to be sitting on the table. I don't know if anyone could see it. Oh, it was totally impromptu. But um, her set was very similar to this. So it's white. Okay. I don't think this was her original set, but very similar to that. So I must have packed her, her set when I moved my mom. My mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Uh, approximately seven years ago, and she started worsening, and I had to move her. So I put her into an independent living. I packed all her things, and I took very important things, put them in the closet. And then what happened was uh, about, um, uh, I guess it would be about four years ago, I went into her closet, and um, I found the set on the closet floor, and I picked it up, and I said to her, I knew she wasn't going to play because she's not really capable of playing, so I asked her uh, if I could take the set and sell it. I don't know what made me say that. And she said, sure. So I took it. And on the way home, I had this brainstorm. And I thought, you know, I really don't want to sell her set. What I want to do is relearn how to play the game. Because okay. I was now retired. And uh, I thought it would be a wonder. I, I brought back all these memories that I had of how uh, the friendship and the game and the noise and the, the, the tiles and my mom had a group, a weekly group that used to come. They would rotate houses. So what I did was I went home and I researched uh, all that I could find on Mahjong, New York City, Manhattan, where I could possibly take classes. And I must have gone to about more than half a dozen uh, classes, teachers. I traveled to Riverdale. I traveled uh, to Long Island. I traveled... Um, uh, where else? Westchester. And I had an assortment of, of teachers and they all had uh, pretty much different styles. And it also depended upon where uh, the teaching occurred. So I did go to one senior center. It was a male teacher and he actually was not qualified in the least to be a teacher. Oh, and no. <laughs> he, he taught incorrectly. Uh, he also what he did that was so funny was that he taught uh, the, the students uh, to stop. Uh, he said, I never do a second Charleston. I, I always stop. And that's and that's basically what he told us he did. So I guess we thought that was the proper thing to do. But luckily, because I had all these other teachers, uh, I learned uh, the proper way. Of course, he never mentioned the uh, Mahjong Made Easy book, which is right here. Yeah, this is the, the, the rule book. And, you know, don't leave home without it. Um, yeah, I really encourage everybody to get it. A lot of times people will say to me that they're, uh, they're seasoned players or I've been playing 50 years and they've been playing 50 years, but they really don't know the rules. But which is not to say that, you know, if they play Mahjong and they're happy playing with their group and they don't know the rules, if they're happy campers, that's fine. But as an instructor and a teacher of Mahjong, I feel that um, uh, that I am uh, I need to know what the rules are. That it, it, you know, otherwise it, I don't qualify as a teacher. Unfortunately, the National Mahjong League does not offer any type of certification for Mahjong teachers or instructors, so anybody can call themselves a Mahjong teacher. Um, mm -hmm. I know Canasta does have certification. Really? Uh, Bridge does have certification, but Mahjong, you know, I could, anyone could wake up tomorrow and say they're a Mahjong teacher, but more power to them. So wow. I do recommend high, it's only a $10 investment and it's something good to have in your games that if there's a question or a problem, you could, uh, you could look at it because yeah. the back of the card can only hold but so much information. I know. And I, I find that I refer to that book weekly, at least a couple times a week, just answering posts on Facebook, let alone playing in a game. And I, it's always good to have that in your set when you're playing the game, because invariably something is going to happen. And to have that handy, there will be few arguments if you can refer to the book and show it the answer in black and white. So. Agreed. So once you went to these lessons and figured out your, you know, the right way to play the game, how did you find a group to play with? 
Okay, so that's a very interesting question. My mentor, the teacher that I love the most, was a lady named Donna who taught out of the library in Baldwin. And um, the, her lessons were extremely good. She was a very um, strict teacher. She, uh, she really knew her stuff. And she, um, she made sure nobody spoke when she was talking. You know, if you spoke, she would tell you, you know, to please, you know, be quiet down. And I just liked her style. And she also knew what she was talking about. And so I absorbed what she said like a sponge. And one day I was out there. And that, where she is, is about uh, about an hour from where I live. So it was a distance for me to travel to get there. But I loved her classes. And then one day she said that the temple nearby, I can't remember the name of the temple, but the temple nearby has open games. So she suggested that I perhaps go and try to play there because once you learn how to play the game you need to get experience you right know? i mean you can play online but there's nothing like live play there's nothing like playing with real people you could practice all you want in the house but you need to play with other people so mm -hmm. i went to the temple and uh, there were two very lovely ladies that ran this group and you would tell them what level you were at and they would seat you at a table and they were always very welcoming and i found the people there really lovely and I started meeting people and I would go every week. And uh, then I heard about a tournament. Somebody said, why don't you go come to a tournament? I'd only been playing about three months. Wow. And uh, so I went to, at, you know, the more you play, the more people you meet. Mm -hmm. you know, if you allow yourself to be open. And then on Mondays, I would travel to Westchester and I would play at one of the libraries. But that game, uh, that was not a lovely group of people. First what of happened? all. Yeah, well, this is interesting. Um, the the people uh, did not know the rules, nor did they wish to play by the rules. They kind of made it up as they went along. Uh, oh, there was this one, call, I don't know if they were a couple or a brother. And I couldn't figure out what they were, but they uh, were very slow players, and they would hold up the game. And this particular man of this of this couple he kept taking his tiles when he would discard and he would form rows of the tiles. Oh. And I think that you would know, I think there's a style of play where they do that. Yeah, is Japanese that Chinese? Mahjong. What is it? Japanese Mahjong. Okay, so he did that, but not because he knew Japanese Mahjong, that was just a habit that he did. So I think, and it drove me crazy. So I think at one point I said to him, you know, put your tiles where everyone else's discard is. You know, let's keep the tiles in the middle. He didn't like that. He, you know, went crazy. And and then other women were having fights and arguing and, and who's sitting where and what's what. And it just, uh, it didn't really work out. I did meet nice people there, though. And, and some people I still maintained a friendship with. Okay. So so just the more I traveled and, and uh, you know, the, the more I opened myself up to meeting other people, uh, the more people I met and the more games I was invited to play in. And then, of course, there was Brian Park. I heard about that. But when I found out about Brian Park, uh, it, the season had already ended. But so I, I could season, not believe it. What is the season at Bryant Park? Oh, um, I believe it's from May up until the end of the summer to, to, to let you know, from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And um, they have games in the park. I see. So a lot of people can go there if they're looking uh, to play more or meet new people. So that was one avenue that I explored. And then, of course, there was this whole meetup. Um, you're familiar with meetup, right? Yeah, I you, am. You Tell me about meetup? your experience with meetup. Sorry? Tell me about your experience with meetup. Well, I needed to find more players in the city because I really didn't know that many because everywhere I went would be out of the city. You know, Long Island was Long Island and then uh, Riverdale was Riverdale. Westchester was far away. So I wanted to find something in Manhattan. So I researched Meetup. I went into meetup.com and I looked up um, um, Marjong Meetups New York. And okay. there was a group. I found a group and I joined the group. And then suddenly... There was no group. You know, the, the organizer didn't contact me. Nobody was contacted. And suddenly I received an email and the email said that the group now has no leader, that the, the, the group's been abandoned 
and that somebody needs to step up to become the, the organizer or leader. Otherwise, the group is in danger of folding. So okay. I, of course, thought that this was addressed personally to me. So I, I said, yes, I will step up and be the leader. And then I get this congratulations. You know, you now have inherited a, a, a meetup group. And I didn't even know I'd never really done meetup. I did a meetup divorce support group many, many years ago. But that was my only experience in meetup. Okay. So I now owned a group and I had to figure out what to do. So luckily they had like a step to a step by step procedure explaining, you know, what you need to do now is, you know, set a date, you need to find a place. And I just followed their procedure and I listed a, a, a game and it was Valentine's Day uh, four years ago. Wow. It was on okay. Valentine's Day. And I think about 10 people showed up. And it was really a wonderful, it was a very good experience. And I learned, you know, as, as I set dates and as I found more and more venues, I learned kind of as I went along. And I know there's a lot of people probably on our, um, on our call tonight that have been to my meetups. I, I have a tremendous oh. amount of uh, friendships formed as a result of that. That's fabulous. Is it hard to find a place to play publicly in New York? It, the hardest place is New York because um, real estate is at such a premium. So okay. as opposed to in the suburbs, you know, you hear about people playing in Panera Bread uh, or they play in um, shopping malls or in bakeries or in supermarkets. You know, we really yeah. don't have such a thing. But luckily, I was able to get space, which we've been doing now for, I think, about a year and a half um, in something called uh, WeWork. Okay, I have and, seen some lovely yeah, photos. So the WeWork is a really wonderful concept of working, and they've allied with, um, with Meetup. And I have access to, to space, and we do, um, we do some of our – in fact, we have a Meetup this Wednesday. So that will be in the Union Square area. Oh, nice. So, so Meetup has worked well for you organizationally. Oh, it's been a dream. It's just been fab. You know, we have a very cohesive group. I ha we have a couple of hundred members. Wow. But our core group is probably several dozen people. Wow. That's and wonderful. we celebrate um, events. Um, we do theme parties. I have a Halloween party coming up. We always dress. Uh -huh. And I, I give awards for best costume. Uh, we've had luncheons where I'm the caterer. We've had luncheons where I found some really wonderful restaurants that will allow us to play there. And we celebrate people's birthdays. We wow. celebrate holidays. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, you know, we come in dressed in green and we really have a great time. Sounds like a fun group. Now, what is it? Obviously, you play lots of mahjong. What is it that is most important to you about the game? What draws you to continue playing? That's a very good question because it's not the game itself that draws me to Mahjong. I think it's the entire package because to me, it's the tiles, it's the aesthetics, it's the, um, I think the, also the, the way that you have to be organized because as I think, um, Jul I was going to say Julia Child, but I think it's Julia Roberts said oh. uh, that it's making order out of chaos. And that's a very good analogy because when you pick up your 13 tiles, you just don't know what you're going to get. Right. You know, it's like a box of chocolates. You just don't know what you're going to get. And you are the one that decides what to do with the 13 tiles that you have. Mm -hmm. And um, and every time it's a surprise, you know, it's opening up a, a box of Cracker Jacks. You don't know what your prize is going to be. Mm -hmm. So and the other part that I really think is is very interesting is that I could be three away from from Marjong after the Charleston or two away from Marjong and I don't mm -hmm. win. And I could have very little of a hand and then I'll pick four jokers in a row. So I think it's that surprise and that excitement because I'm kind of like an adrenaline junkie and okay. I don't like things always being the same because to me that would be very boring. Um, and I did a little study in terms of the fifth person as the better. Okay. I did a little study for a while to see with my theory that you can't predict who's going to win. So right. I guess go? my theory was that it would be around 30%. And of accuracy. And for the study that I did, I mean, of course, I don't think it was that scientific, 
but but it did it did come out to about that amount. So that oh. when the better walks around and they write down the name of the person they're going to win at the end of the evening, I just kept I checked off every time the better was correct, and I kept all those pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. So that kind of proves my theory that you can't really predict. And I think that's what I like about Marjan is very unpredictable. Yeah. And that makes it exciting, at least for me, because when you win and you had absolutely nothing, it's very exciting. Yeah, it is. Even if you get close. It could be yeah. for some people. Yeah. If you don't, winning is nice, but just every hand is a journey. So it's uh, fun to play. And also, as you were uh, talking, it reminded me of, um, you know, where you say you could you either have two away from winning and not win or have nothing and draw jokers. And with that, you could also say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Everybody sees the tiles a little differently and you might see the tiles and play one particular category or hand and I could do something completely different and we could either one of us could make it work and win. I agree a hundred percent because I always said that if you if you put out the same thirteen tiles to five uh, professional I call it professional marjan players and ask them how would you play these tiles I really think you would get a lot of differences of opinion I don't think that that five people would say you know I'm gonna play this category or that category mm -hmm. sometimes if I'm really feeling challenged. I'll pick a hand or, or a section that might be very hard to play because there's a lot of crossover on this year's card. You know, every singles and pairs hand comes from one of the sections. Mm -hmm. So I could choose to play it real easy or I could choose to play it out of the out of the singles and pairs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are a lot of times where I, where I'm feeling frisky, I'll play a difficult <laughs> hand just you know, and, you know, some people dot their cards. I had been dotting my card, but unfortunately, um, I lost my entire bag with all of my cards and it's very oh, no. sad. So, so I haven't been dotting because the card disappeared. Oh, but no. um, a lot of times when you're doing that and you're dotting the card and you're keeping track of how you're doing, you're forced to play hands that maybe you haven't tried or haven't, you know, given it given it a chance mm -hmm. so i think that's also fun because we all know that hand i call it the dreaded hand because you know the d stand for dreaded hand instead of dragons yeah it's the consecutive run with the flowers and dragons we all we all make fun of that hand but uh it's a very easy hand to make and i sometimes i just say i know i could play this hand but i'm mm -hmm. going to play something else and that's oh, okay. just that's it's just something it. that I personally do, whereas other people will say, well, a win is a win. So that's a personal decision. Do you find that people tend to play favorites? Um, yes and no. I think that when you're playing with a group and you get to know the people in your group, there mm -hmm. are certain people that might tend to play uh, certain hands. Uh, I noticed too, I, I used to watch, I did a lot of observation in, in my private group. I noticed, I learned by observing. So okay. this one gal never really showed her tiles. And every time we would just, you know, we were ended the game, mm -hmm. she would very um, discreetly put her, you know, turn her tiles over so you couldn't see what she was playing. So I said, hmm, that sounds like a good idea. So that's actually something I do now. And it's not to be rude, but... Okay. Frankly, I don't really think other players are that interested in what you're playing. I think that's more when you're learning. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to kind of share and talk about the experience. But, you know, in an advanced game, you know, somebody wins, you pay the winner and you move on to the next game. In your private games, do you play with all experienced players, advanced players? Yes. Yeah, we're all tournament players. Oh, wow. Okay. That's good. So the, the speed of the game, the momentum of the game is consistent, right? Correct. Yeah. And I think too, I think one of the reasons, because I ask people why they go to tournaments. And a lot of times I hear that people go to tournaments because they want to have, they want to experience a fast game. A lot of people that I talk to tell me that there's one player in their group or some people are so slow. And I hear these horror stories about people playing so slowly. So they go to tournaments, number one, because they want to play for many hours. They want a serious game. 
mm-hmm. you know, because in a lot of the private games, there's a lot of chit chat, social, you know, people are talking, they're eating, they're laughing, they're taking phone calls. Whereas in a tournament, it's a lot stricter and it's m- much more of a serious nature of the game. Yes, true. I've, I've sensed that as well. Although some, I have this tournament that I'm going to, I think next week is a smaller one. It seems the smaller they are, the more low key they are, the bigger they are, the more intense they get. That's been my experience with it. I don't play in many tournaments personally. Um, it's not my it's not my favorite thing to do, and I guess people know that. In the beginning, I did go to several tournaments. Mm-hmm. I I'm, I think I'm challenged enough between my teaching and my meetup groups and my regular games that I don't I don't feel that a tournament is going to do anything great, other than maybe meeting you know people that I haven't seen in a while or getting to meet new people. Okay. But it, it can be a little stressful for some, you know, they find, mm-hmm. but I like to, I dabble in tournaments every now and then, you know, I, I, I'll i just uh, go to one, but it's not something that I look for. Okay. I would imagine in New York, there are probably many going on all the time. Well, not in Manhattan. We don't have, we don't have, we have, there are very few in Manhattan, but there are certainly in the outer boroughs. Oh. Uh, there's plenty to choose from. And then there's, you know, the weekend, um, uh, tournaments where you go to, you know, Piscataway, New Jersey has a weekend tournament. And there are a couple of tournament directors that have um, tour. They're very easy to, to find on the internet. Oh, okay. Very good. And I, I also was just thinking that in New York, because the game was established there, that there are probably groups everywhere. I wonder if you could even see people playing outside delis and whatnot. Uh, in not the, in New York. New York. Not so much. Okay. Yeah, maybe in Chinatown, but those are not people that are playing American Mahjong. Pardon? In Chinatown, you might see Mahjong, but they're not playing American Mahjong. Oh, that would be interesting. Yeah, mostly people play in their homes. I, I would say oh. that 80% of, of Mahjong players, maybe even 90%, uh, play in each other's homes. So you may not even know that your neighbor's playing Mahjong in her apartment, for instance. Okay. So would you say that the a game in an open venue is much different than the game played in a home? I would imagine that a game played in a home would be more with friends versus a public, more drop-in environment. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In a home, you choose who you're going to play with. Mm-hmm. Um, most people have been in their group for many, many years. There are people I've heard of that have been playing together 40, 50 years. Wow. And... Um, uh, you know, in New York, a lot of people live 50% of the time in Florida. They call them snowbirds. Mm-hmm, I've so heard that. Of Florida, and then those people have to find people to play with because a lot of the snowbirds are gone in, in the winter months. But yeah. our group is still, we're still all here, my group. Okay. Well, you mentioned a little bit ago about teaching. What prompted you to begin teaching the game? You know, I'm a retired nurse and I, I, I did nursing for about 43 years. And in my nursing career, I did do a lot of mentorship and I did uh, teach a lot of uh, nursing students or new nurses that came to, you know, that came to our area. Um, I helped them to get started. Uh, they called it preceptorship. So I, I took a lot of preceptors under my wing. So I guess I always had that love of helping, you know, nursing is a helping profession. Mm -hmm. Um, And I enjoy teaching. Uh, Even though I never went for my master's in teaching, I just enjoy it. I like explaining things and and showing people how to do things. And it just evolved. I, I, um, oh, I know what happened. When When I did the meetup group, I realized that in order for this to succeed, I couldn't have just anybody come to a meetup because it would depend upon what level you were at. So I wound up with three different, uh, it, when, you, when, you, when you're an organizer of meetup, you're allowed to run three different meetup groups. So what I did was I took the three available groups that I had and I put them into levels. So I had beginners and then I had, inter, and then I had um, kind of intermediate and then advanced. 
Okay. So with the beginner, it was really learn to play American Mahjong. And mm -hmm. I made it a, 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 you know, people would sign up in the, in the meetup and I'd say, okay, you know, how long have you been playing? And they'd say, oh, I don't know how to play. I want to learn how to play. So I realized that that title was no good because um, it, it wasn't specific enough. It just said, you know, Mahjong lovers, that doesn't mean anything. I just mm -hmm. assumed that it meant you knew how to play. So it, it boiled down to three different groups and that's how I started the teaching. And then word of mouth, um, uh, word, you know, just people heard about me and, uh, and, and it, it's, it's very hard, in, especially in New York City. <clears throat> if I post a beginner's game that I'm teaching um, Mahjong and I give three consecutive weeks, it's really best to do the lessons very close together. You know, I do two hour lessons. You know, you can't have a lesson today and then a lesson next month. That, right. That's just not going to work. So they I would put it. down three consecutive weeks and people would respond and they would say, well, I can make it the first and the third. I can't make it the second. And then you have to get a group together. So it became a little complicated. So I had several groups that were very successful. And those people stayed on with me and they continued to come to the meetup. In fact, I still have people come. I have a lady coming Wednesday who's with me from the, she was taught by me. Wow. And, um, and uh, so, so that's how that teaching began. And I don't advertise. I don't, uh, it's all really through word of mouth. Well, it sounds like it's become a great success. You've been doing it a while and you have found a way to make it work by dividing into, into groups. I like that idea. Right now, I, I have a, a meetup, but it's very small. So we don't have near enough players to divide by group. But I imagine that when I get big enough, maybe we'll have a an open game where everybody is welcome and then an advanced game where you need to play maybe a 12-minute game. And that way, more advanced players can if they want to play a nice fast game, they can choose to go to that. So I like that idea of dividing the different meetups by skill level. You probably minimize the potential issues that might come up in a game. If you're having a beginner with an advanced player, for example, some of the, some fireworks could potentially go off, I think. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Michelle, do you think there's um, any of the people have questions for yes. us? Yeah, we've been talking for about a half an hour, so I'm going to look at comments and see if we can uh, open this up to some Q&A. If anyone watching the show would like to ask questions uh, for Ahuva and I, we'd be happy to answer. So let me just scroll from the bottom up and see. Some guy, some wise guys playing Mahjong online and watching us. And I, saw, I, I saw a glimpse of that. Let's see. Uh, oh, somebody, somebody remembers my quizzing them to determine the level before I went to my first meetup. See, we can't see who that is. Which well, maybe Michelle can, I can. Let's see here. I'll, I'll look and see. Um, I wanted to see on Facebook. It doesn't allow me to scroll there, so I won't be able to speak to who made the comment. But Exactly. Do, they're, they're remaining anonymous. <laughs> I do see where somebody mentioned something about the wooden tiles was the Mahjong Supply Company. Um, let's see. Box of chocolates theory. Uh, oh, you can you can see also the, the comments there. I just don't know who said them. Oh, okay. Oh, Dara Moshe Collins and I had a great time playing in Bryant Park. Oh, very good. And I, I think, uh, was it Kirsten also mentioned something about playing or me, perhaps being in New York? Uh, let's see. If anybody has any questions, write them in the comment section. We'll open this up to some Q&A if you'd like. We'll be on for maybe another five or ten minutes. So if you have questions, now would be the time. So maybe I could just talk a little bit about the fact that um, what I love about Mahjong, in addition to the tiles, sure. uh, what I wanted to say was my, my history as a nurse, I, I had a calling when I was about eight years old, um, and the calling was to become a, a nurse. 
but I always loved music and art. And my music teacher wanted me to pursue music and my art teacher wanted me to pursue art. And okay. uh, I did neither because I told the teacher, well, I'm going to become a nurse. And everybody laughed at me because they said I was afraid of the sight of blood. They said, you oh. cannot become a nurse because you're afraid of blood. And I said, well, I'm going to become a nurse. You watch and see. So P.S., I did become a nurse, but never trauma, never ER. I actually became a hospice nurse and a home care specialist. So I did not, you know, cutting up pieces of the body is not, not my idea of fun. So when I retired, I always had this love of art and design and, and music. And somehow I incorporated it. I learned how to sew. And I, I do a lot of decorative mahjong. So uh, the, the, the table scapes that a lot of us enjoy, uh, vintage fabrics. I specialize in vintage fabrics. I love to see a well-set table. It's like inviting people over for dinner. You're not going to serve them on paper plates. A lot of mahjong, you know, generic mahjong players, they really don't care that you have a fancy tablecloth. They're happy with, with you know, a Timex watch. To have a standard set that you could buy online on Amazon for $50 with plastic uh, racks is good for them. They're, they're happy. But mm -hmm. some of us really enjoy uh, the aesthetics. Uh, I, I call it accoutrement of all the, of all the, the things that go along with uh, with with the and when you start collecting and you see all these beautiful tiles and yeah. the engraving, you know, I just started collecting some of D Gallo's sets, you know, and I actually I'm a, I'm a very proud owner of two of her hand uh, um, uh, engraved sets, and you know, in the short time that I've been playing, to have two D Gallo sets is really an incredible uh, accomplishment, and and I just feel so proud and so you know, excited to have that because that was always my dream. Okay. Well, I'll have to look look that up. And how do you spell the name? Uh, D Gallo, D E G A L L O. I'll, I'll give you the, the information. She has a website. She's yeah. Red Coin Marjan, Red Coin. That's what I was she's thinking in my yep, mind. She's Red Coin. Okay. I yep. couldn't put together the artist or the designer. Let me hold up. I, you know, I just happen to have this. This is a beautiful rack. I hope you could see this. I don't know if it's James is on oh, the wow, line. Oh, wow, that's a rack. I don't know if James is on the line, but James, I guess you're finding out that I copied you. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. If anyone Ooh, wants to know where to get this, everything. just send wow. me. This was handcrafted by one of our members' uh, husbands. Wow, and beautiful. It, we played with it the other night, and it's just fabulous. It's not Bakelite. It's wood, and it's all handmade by a wow. craftsperson. So you to ever, me, some, something like that is, is priceless. It's just beautiful. Are you ever nervous to bring out vintage sets and special accoutrement like that? Well, I haven't, no, not really. I think if you pack it well and you drag it to where you're going and people are respectful, mm -hmm. you know, you, you just want to have a good time. Would I bring out a, I don't know. I, I, I've brought in rope sets to meetups. Okay. Why not? Um, someone red I point. Somebody have said red. Couple. Nice rack. You know, that's getting yeah. very personal. <laughs> Here's my rack. Very nice. Mahjong Diva there. There's, there's a, a, a t-shirt that somebody Davis. wears. It's a don't touch my rack. I don't have that t-shirt. <laughs> but we well, know who does. Somebody had said that we might be missing some comments and someone had instant messaged me. Thank you, Dara. She said that when, uh, let's see, when people have been playing a long time, but they are playing incorrectly, what is your method for correcting them? Okay, that is helping them to learn the correct. Okay. Rules? That is such a pertinent question because yes. people think that I've been playing for 50 years equals I'm an expert. Somebody tells me they're playing for 50 years. I know they're not. An expert probably playing three months knows more than the 50-year player. However, the player that's been playing for 50 years is playing with other people, and they're all doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So they don't care that moving the tile means that it's, your, that it's yours, you know, or they uh, they just play. They, they, they each play the way they like to play, mm -hmm. and that's how they play. So um, I forgot the question, something about... Yeah. 
if you were to encounter a situation like uh, that, would you address good. it or would you, when in Rome, do as the Rome? Yeah, the Rome is? thing, definitely the Rome. Because uh, people are very, uh, you know, with my nursing background, I'm trained in human behavior. You mm -hmm. can't change, it's very difficult to change people. That's why I like teaching Mahjong, because when I get somebody that has no idea whatsoever, I can teach them the proper etiquette and that you don't grab a, a, a joker off somebody's rack. I can't tell you how many times at a tournament or playing mm -hmm. with people, the old timers, and yeah. they grab those, They because they all do it. You know, yeah. they don't see anything wrong with it. You can't correct mm -hmm. them. And, and they're just, they just, that's just how they play. So you have to just accept it. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to want to take uh, uh, Miss Ahuva correcting them. It's just not going to, you know, they're, they're not really asking for, for advice. So if you see somebody doing something incorrectly, it's your call as to whether or not you think they would be uh, amenable to, to knowing. Somebody asked if um, I've ever played at Sarah Betts. Yes, I have. I didn't there, hear the question. What did you somebody say? asked, have you ever played at Sarah Bess? Sarah Bess is a restaurant on Park Avenue in the in the oh. high 20s. And there's a lady who's been around many, many, many years, over 25 years, Linda Feinstein. And she has uh, a restaurant and um, uh, she has about 100 people playing at this restaurant. She's been there quite a while. And uh, she's been doing this a very long time. So that is another option for people. And there's some, there are many, many options of where to play. There's some on a very high end, you know, Sarah Betts, you know, you play, you pay for a luncheon and, um, and that serves people's needs. And then there's other types of games and senior centers. Um, there's meetups. Uh, I'm the only meetup that I know of in New York. There are a couple of meetups. I just heard of a meetup in New York. Uh, it might be in Brooklyn where they're playing Chinese um, mahjong okay. or some other style, which I'm kind of hesitant about learning another style because for me, I feel like uh, I don't even know that I'm that interested, but I would maybe want to come and just see what they're doing. I see. Yeah. I'm not sure. Some people so like answer be a one rather than a jack of all trades, I suppose. So uh, let me see here. I think somebody mentioned something about, about sets and how beautiful they are and how nice it is to play with unique sets that people feel special playing with beautiful, interesting sets. The, uh, the Facebook somebody, yeah, name. Somebody, sorry, somebody also said no paddle mixing with vintage sets. They oh. sell these crazy things called paddles. Yes. And they're like plastic things. And it's like, you know, making scrambled eggs. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to be using. I know a lot of people with the modern sets, you know, nothing happens to those tiles. So have fun mixing. But if you're, if you're playing with someone else's set, just be respectful that, that it's not your set. And that um, if it's your set and you want to do that, throw, fling the tiles up in the air, fine. But just be respectful of the of the of of the set that you're using if it's you know somebody sharing their their mm -hmm. set with you. I tend to bring uh, modern sets to the meetups because people are hard, hard on the tiles. There are some people that when the game is over, they'll just take their rack and they just throw the tiles in the air to okay. to clear their rack. <laughs> And those are those are habits that that is very hard to break. Like I've told this one person a couple times not to do it. So what she does is she does it kind of gently, but every time I see it go like this, mm -hmm. I get a little nervous. So yeah. if I bring tiles that are kind of modern, I don't think anything will happen to them. Yeah, I think I would cringe a little if I had my vintage set and someone was using a paddle. Someone did have a question about uh, teaching, and so I wanted to pose the question. This was from Bonnie. How do you handle teaching a class when one person just doesn't get it? Oh, I did have that. Um, yeah, I, had, uh, I had one lady that um, was with me for a very long time and uh, she didn't get it. I never said anything because she wasn't disruptive. But what she did was she used to like stare at me while I was teaching with this very quizzical. She'd be like, <laughs> and I, and I, I could just tell that she wasn't getting it. And so one day, and she just kept coming and she was a, a lovely lady. I really liked her. 
So one day she said to me, I want you, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be very honest with me. And I said, what is it? She said, do you think this game might not be for me? And I said, well, well, I would never say that something is not for you. I said, that's for you to decide whether you are enjoying it or it's not really meeting your needs. And she said, I think I'm going to have to stop because uh, I don't feel like I'm making any progress. And um, that was the only person that I, I think that was the only student that I ever really lost. But it wasn't mm-hmm. for me telling her that she couldn't play, you know, and then other people, they just keep coming to class, you know, and maybe they like the social element of it, mm-hmm. you know, and as long as they're not disrupting, you know, if you want to get better in the game, if you know how to play, you want to get better, just don't hold up the game, you know, play with people that are better than you. And just even if you have to pick and throw mm-hmm. uh, or do something like that, you just don't want to hold, you know, what really upsets people is when you're holding up the game, you know, the game needs to flow, there needs to have a rhythm. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've heard stories where what one player is very slow, and I hear people say, Oh, I just take out my cell phone if somebody's very slow. And I'm Would you like, say that's a pet peeve of yours? Uh, what, the, the cell phone or um, the slow people, player? People or using a phone. There was just a big conversation about that on social media, about people using phones. Well, I think you have to, ha- I think that you can't assume that people know it's wrong because there are a lot of younger players. And I, lately I've, ta- I've been teaching a lot of younger mothers uh, down in uh, Tribeca. And their phone is right. I, I would never say to them, you have to put your phone away because their phone is part one gal has some kind of business or yeah. they just feel very connected to their phones. Mm-hmm. And it's just part of who they are. And they're very accepting of one another with the phone. They text, they, they talk, you know, I'm not mm-hmm. going to say you can't do that. Okay. You know, uh, if it's my, if they're coming into my home and playing in my game, then I might have certain rules. You know, when I have the meetup, then I set the rule. Like lately I had a no phone policy because people, not that, you know, how can I explain it? Every once in a while, somebody's phone will ring. For the most part, people don't take calls. Mm -hmm. You know, they know. And and if you're playing five people, you're going to be out anyway. Right. And it's not yet to see an emergency in Mahjong. I mean, one time somebody, I think they had a baby or something like that. Somebody had a baby. And so they announced to the group, oh, Mazel Tov, you know, so-and-so just had a baby. But um, it's up to your group. It's really up to, some people don't mind. You know, I I personally get very distracted. If somebody's, if somebody has their phone in their lap and they're texting, I, I, I can feel it. I pick up on it right away and I find it, I, I get distracted. Or yeah. if the better is standing behind me, mm-hmm. I get, I'm distracted. I can't concentrate because I feel the energy. I'm very sensitive to that. Whereas other people say, you could stand behind me. I don't care. So it's really a personal, a personal decision. And it's mm-hmm. up to your group, whether, you, whether or not you want to allow uh, phones, if it's going to get in the way. But, you know, to be playing a game and somebody's taking a long time and somebody gets on their phone, to me, I, I would never, I can't even picture that. Right. So really, it's just respect for the game, I suppose, if we all ha- well, share the same I mean, respect for the game. Pardon? I think it's what, I don't allow food. There's no food at my table. There's no uh, uh, wallets or, or money bags. I like the table very, very clear because mm-hmm. when I pass, I want to have that space to pass very, very clear. I don't want to have to guess, well, where's her pass? Because mm-hmm. her li- her lipstick is there and, and all this <laughs> other stuff. Uh, and then I got to figure out, is this the, is this the, whose pass is that? Is that an, is that an across? Is that the left? There shouldn't be confusion. It should yeah. be clear. So what I do, what you have to do is provide uh, a surface for people to keep their things. Mm-hmm. So I don't like things on the floor. So either I'll have a a chair or a little side table. Mm -hmm. You can have your drink on there. You can have your, your, if you're eating something, your money or your, anything you want, your gum. But I like the table to be clear. I do too. I agree a hundred percent. I, I am a bit OCD and I get a little claustrophobic if there's clutter. 
clutter so it just yeah. makes me anxious and also you know when you have a short wall sometimes the pass looks like the short wall so absolutely that that could be an issue so someone was mentioning something about um mahjong etiquette and i'm i'm working on something for that myself i've been researching in japanese mahjong there's a whole new sort of community expectation of manners and so i'm studying manners in japanese mahjong and trying to see how that could maybe be introduced into the way i play the game subtly of course you know i would never put my own um you know uh, what I feel is polite, et cetera, or etiquette, you know, some of this is subjective and some what's polite to one person may not be, or may be rude to somebody else or vice versa. So I think if you find a group where everybody is like-minded, then you should all be just fine. If everyone plays the same way, passes, you know, has a clear table, et cetera, you all kind of get used to everybody's preferences you can make the game friendly and comfortable for everybody absolutely here's a question about how do you handle people who throw the tiles in after the hand so what i'm assuming what this i don't know if this means throw the tile that they're being rough with the tile or do you mean that they don't check so the right procedure um after somebody declares mahjong is what's called verifying the mahjong so the minute someone says Mahjong, everybody at the table really should be looking at that person's Mahjong and verifying that it's a true Mahjong, okay? So that question might have to do with, there are people, when someone says Mahjong, they just throw their tiles in. So that's mm -hmm. possibly what that person meant. And that we had a player that did that, and uh, it was very annoying. And one time I mentioned, I said, well, you know, we haven't even you know, seen her, her hand. And her answer was, oh, she's a good player. She knows what she's doing, which mm. is a good answer. But what happened was the good player who knew what she was doing made a mistake. Oh. So, so it really wasn't a good Marjan. So the, the woman that threw in her tiles, now she's dead. Yeah. And, and the player with the, with the, you know, incorrect Marjan, you know, Marjan and error, she's dead. So you have two people left. Right. So, so I don't know which way they meant this question about people who throw the tiles in. Maybe eventually people learn per the rules. If you throw your tiles in without validating the hand over time, you'll know not to do that so that you can validate the hand. Well, they're anxious to get on to the next game. But the rule does sure. say the book does say that you have to validate the margin. That's not a made up rule. That's a real rule. As someone yeah. mentioned here, uh, what about when you are hosting a meetup, uh, then it is your proper rules. I don't know what that means. But Let's see. Proper rules. I don't know. I guess if it's your group, you decide uh, what, mm -hmm. how you want to, what rules you're going to follow. So essentially, I follow the National Mahjong League rules. However, I had a situation where I felt people were discarding uh, tiles at the end of the game that pro it was probably not a good idea to be discarding and people were calling Mahjong. So I instituted a hot wall, which is really a table rule. So mm -hmm. this way, if somebody throws a hot tile, which we're not, we don't have to get into what it actually means, but if they're throwing a hot tile and the per and someone calls Mahjong, they pay for the table. So yeah. maybe they'll be a little more careful, which is the proper way to, you know, strategy wise, Mm -hmm. It's important to, to know that, you know, what you're throwing at the end of the game is critical. Yes, it is, especially if you know you can't win. Exactly. Yeah. A war game is to me like a win. When we have a war game, I feel like I won because nobody made Mahjong. It was a draw. It was Equal, a draw. Equitable. Somebody here is asking a question about, as a, an organizer, I, I guess, how would you handle it if somebody shows up visibly ill? Oh, I thought you were going to say visibly drunk. That never Vis happened. Well, that's never happened to me. Thank well, goodness. You know, that's a new. That's a new big subject now with the with the coughing and the sneezing and the and the sick and the being sick. So yes. recently, I had to I had to cancel my um my uh I, I was going to a game and I didn't feel well that morning and I called up uh the the 
the person who's, uh, whose house it was. And I said, look, I'm not feeling great. My throat's bothering me. I'm coughing. And I think it's better I don't show up. She said, thank you very much. And I was the fifth player. Okay. It's funny because Marjan players hate not having a game. So that's why we play five people. This way you have that little uh, uh, insurance that you'll still have a game if somebody that doesn't show up. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a catch-22. I say if you're sick, most people will tell you that they don't want to play with a sick player. But um, uh, does that answer the question? People yeah. don't like it when, when, when a Mahjong player shows up uh, coughing or, or sick. I, I've seen situations where people get pretty upset and they'll get their sanitizer out and put it on the table and use it after touching tiles. And one of the things that I try to be cognizant about every now and again, I'll, I'll maybe put my hand on my chin and I'm trying to break that because I do not want my oh, hand. I do that all the time. Face. My hand's always on my face. I'm just a, I am trying to be a little more cognizant of it because if someone is ill and, and I'm touching the tiles and then I'm putting my hand up by my face, I just want to try to break myself of that for that particular reason. But I don't want to be too, you know, fastidious about that because, you know, we're touching the same tiles as long as we don't touch our face. Um, it should be okay now then there's also you were mentioning earlier about having food at the table and um having chocolate stains on tiles if people are eating messy food and things like that so i, I suppose all that kind of goes into a similar uh, discussion and some people just don't care to have food at the table to get the tiles mucked up and also illnesses with you know, germs and whatnot, I suppose that kind of can be in the same vein. So, well, I think we're we're heading up to our one hour mark and I don't want to hold a hoover up too, too much longer. Wrote, I never, I never put my lipstick on the table, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Did I, don't know. Write that? <laughs> I put the lipstick on my lips, not on the table. I did see that somebody asked a question about what, what led me to do videos, and I will happily take that question offline and comment to you directly uh, under the chat so that I can share my story there. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed the session, and I want to thank Ahuva for taking the time to meet with me, not only tonight, but in advance. We had some uh, opportunities to get to know each other, and it was a pleasure to have you on the show, Ahuva. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for asking me, Michelle. I look yeah. forward to doing it again sometime. Oh, it was fabulous. And thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Well, if there's interest in these uh, um, joint sessions, the collaboration, if you all like this kind of format, this table talk episode, please let me know in the comment section and I'll see what I can do to arrange more shows like this where we can meet with players from around the country. So with that being said, thank you again for joining us on this episode of Table Talk. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you at the next episode. Bye-bye.